I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Our presenter is Dr. Arjun Krishnan. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Computational Mathematics, Science, and Engineering with a joint appointment in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. Arjun completed his bachelor's degree in biotechnology in India before moving to the U.S. to earn his Ph.D. in computational biology at Virginia Tech. Following that, he completed postdoctoral research at Princeton University. He was then recruited to MSU under the Global Impact Initiative to join the new CMSE department. He currently leads a team of students and postdocs working broadly in the areas of computational genomics and biomedical data science. Arjun was recently awarded a highly competitive R35 grant, also known as a MIRA, Maximizing Investigators Research Award, from the NIH National Institute of General Medical Sciences. This is a flexible five-year grant. It's a very special kind of grant, which allows the investigator uh, special freedom to work on projects of uh, their interest. And I think you'll hear from in his presentation that uh, he's working on a very broad number of topics, which will, uh, many of which will have an important impact in healthcare. So, Arjun. Uh, thank you so much, Steve. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, today, what I want to do uh, is to tell you a little bit about our group and what we care about in terms of research and education. Um, if I wanted to introduce myself in one slide, it would be this, that I'm a Jurassic Park kid. I watched this movie when I was nine years old in a small town in India, and I was totally fascinated by what was going on on the screen, and that I decided to study genetics and hopefully, at a later point of time, also do some research on the stuff. And what is also cool in this, there is some scene later in the movie where Lex enters this room where the adults are struggling to close the door, and she goes to the computer terminal and says, this is Unix, I know how to do this stuff. I think clickety-clack, she closes all the doors for the adults. Mm -hmm. So it was just fascinating to me. And I, I'm, I think that the journey that started there has ultimately led to my uh, position here, which I'm very lucky to begin, uh, which is leading this research group where we really care about uh, applying genetics and molecular biology to the study of human uh, condition and human uh, diseases. We essentially care about com common diseases like autism, hypertension, or diabetes, which are extremely complex because there are hundreds of genes or even thousands of genes that are involved in any given condition, and how they work with each other and how they ultimately affect health and then disease is something that is very interesting to us. And our take on how to go about studying this is to actually take advantage of tons of data that's available to us. This is anything from DNA sequencing up to electronic health records that you would find when people go to the hospital and submit their forms. We want to take all this data and then develop new algorithms that can work on this complex data to ultimately give us two things. One are models that can essentially capture what's going on inside our body. And second, predictions about what might happen when a new person comes into the clinic based on what we can see in their DNA and their molecular profiles. So we want to do, do two things at the same time. And this research is not possible at all, for example, just by myself, because I have a background in biology and a little bit of computer science. So our lab is filled with people who have very diverse background in biology, computer science, statistics, engineering, mathematics, and physics. And the three major research directions that we have in our group are the following. The first is that we want to actually understand, see if we can develop methods to figure out how what we call as disease, let's say diabetes, is not one single disease, but actually many subtypes of diseases. So we want to use algorithms to find out how we can find these subgroups of people who have the same disease for the same set of reasons so that we can help diagnosis and treatment. The second is that actually diseases and health conditions vary tremendously by age and sex. And we do not understand, actually have a lack of fundamental understanding about how diseases come about, how they are diagnosed, and how they are treated when patients of different sexes and ages come into the clinic. And we want to see how we can help in that direction. And third is that a lot of human biology is studied through genetic testing and drug testing in model algorithms like mice, fish, and flies. So what we want to do is to develop algorithms to translate knowledge that we gain from these model organisms back into humans and see how they become meaningful. Uh, to give you a specific example of how, how we go about this, we do a lot of work studying autism spectrum disorder, a common neurodevelopmental uh, uh, disability, 
Uh, it is diagnosed at around three years of age, but it would be great if we can actually diagnose this much earlier on so that we can start therapy earlier on. So what we want to do is to see, can we develop a di genetic diagnostic for this? And that essentially means seeing if we can actually discover all the genes that are responsible for increasing the risk of autism spectrum disorder. And our question is, can algorithms help the, this quest? The way we go about doing this is to, for example, construct something, what we call the social network of genes. So for example, if you log into Facebook, they will say, here's your long lost high school friend whom you might want to connect on Facebook. The way they do that is your current friends on Facebook and their current friends on Facebook are very similar to each other. So we use very similar approaches to take what we can learn from known autism genes and then predict new autism associated genes. So based on this approach, we have predicted hundreds of new genes which we are now taking, uh, trying to take to the next step. Uh, I talked about autism, but through extensive collaborations with experimental scientists and clinical scientists both at MSU and outside, we work on a number of, diff apply these methods to a number of different disorders like uh, adolescent eating disorder, gastrointestinal disorders, abnormal pregnancy, cardiomyopathies, and so forth. Um, so this sort of helps me uh, pivot to the next thing that I want to talk about, which is that as we sift, develop all these complex algorithms and sift through large amounts of data, we are building these complex models. And many times, this, these models can be extremely tricky in what they can capture, and we need to be very, very careful. So what I mean is that, for example, if we take this, this mock data, which tells you about uh, data points that we observe between uh, variable one and variable two, we might see that, oh, you know what, we can actually fit a straight line through this model. And this straight line represents a linear relationship between variable one and variable two. So this straight line is actually a model of the underlying data. But this model can, even the simple model, can be tricked in many different ways. So for example, there was a study that was published in 1960s which said that there is a huge, strong negative correlation between voter turnout and income inequality. And when 20 years later, scientists looked at the data, this negative correlation was driven by data point from one specific country, South Africa. Then if you remove that country out, there was actually no correlation between these two quantities. So models can be tricked by extreme data and hidden data. Models can also miss patterns that they are not developed for. For example, if the model tells you that there's actually no correlation between two variables, we might imagine data that looks all over the place scattered like this, but even data like this will give you zero correlation if you're trying to fit a straight line through this data. Models can also be very tricky if we apply this to large quantities of data and try to find associations within this data sets. For example, this is a plot that shows a year-by-year -year correlation between the number of people who drown and the number of films Nicolas Cage pathways in. There is a strong correlation, but it's not clear, of course, there's no causal relationship between these two. So these are all things that researchers have to be very careful when we actually apply algorithms and models. The second is we are not only developing models, but as regular people, we are actually consuming the results of models every single day. So for example, if we turn a look at a newspaper or a magazine, we'll see medical studies that say something that we eat increases the risk of cancer or decreases the risk of cancer. But if we look at all these studies as a whole, it turns out that everything that we eat has been associated with both increased or decreased risk of cancer. And for example, to make this more concrete, for example, Time Magazine Twitter posted this tweet called coffee is a problem because it causes increases the risk of cancer. And then later it posted coffee can make you live longer. And you'll notice that they made this within 30 minutes of each other right? <laughs> on the same day. Models can also be, outputs can also be very tricky because we also need to understand the context from which the data was originally generated. Most of medical studies are actually done in either petri dishes are in mice, and it is not very easy to translate them to how they are relevant to humans. Uh, so this is a very important aspect in terms of transparency and replicability. And a favorite uh, joke that I actually uh, like in this context is a scientist says, my findings are meaningless if taken out of context, and the media says, scientists claim findings are meaningless. <laughs> Uh, so to sort of remedy the situation in some way, what uh, I've done is to develop this course called Gaps, Missteps, and Errors in Statistical Data Analysis. I offer this in every, every November for a month. It's open to students, postdocs, staff, and faculty, where we dig deep into these aspects and discuss the essential concepts that are important for both practice of data analysis and critical interpretation of data analysis. So if this or any of the aspects of research that I've talked about piques your interest, please visit our webpage or shoot an email to me or tweet at, uh, tweet at us. And with that, I want to thank my awesome group who did, actually, to, did all, all the work and the funding agencies for keeping the light on and for this opportunity. Thank you so much.
question for our speaker. Do you have anybody uh, in your department or working for you that's building algorithms to trade on, you know, stock market trends? Oh. <laughs> uh, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, probably different departments. <laughs> but there are a couple of people in uh, uh, my department where their methods can easily be developed. Uh, attached to that. Was there a specific reason you were talking, asking about <laughs> My clients would be happy. Uh, <laughs> sure. Steve, is there any relation with your project with this well, one? Well, uh, it's part of a general approach, understanding that um, because it's become much less expensive to gather genomic data, the availability of that data will lead to the ability to predict disease risk directly from uh, measured genomic, uh, measured genotype. So there's, there's quite a lot of people on this campus that we've carefully assembled that are capable of doing this kind of work now. And uh, if I may add to that, I think the connection, uh, if I may add to that, the connection uh, is also that what we are interested in this doing is not only prediction, but also explaining these predictions through very, a very step-by-step -step analysis of how genes relate to what goes on inside healthy cells and then slowly understand how they relate to disease in a very step-by-step -step way. Can you speak to the uh, advantages of the collaboration between all these disciplines and perhaps some of the challenges that you face as you work together? Oh, uh, that's actually a great question. I think uh, I totally jumped ship when I was an undergrad trying to do experiments in my lab and I said, I'm really not good at this. And then I also got fascinated by computer programming. So I jumped ship from biology to computer science. So I think because of my own thing, it has sort of helped me understand what are the difficulties in translating Accra. Uh, across fields, but I think that also really helped in finding out what is the language that each group speaks, which turns out to be very, very different when they're even talking about exactly the same thing. So I think that has really helped a lot. And the second thing that I will say is that uh, there are perspectives that I learn from my students and postdocs every single day because of their completely different backgrounds that I absolutely would not have thought of because they come from fresh eyes from completely different training and that has been super helpful. And within MSU itself, I think, because the there is research, as far as I can see, is extremely flat in terms of being able to get in touch with other people and collaborate, so, which has been very easy to establish these collaborations very fast, because I've been here just for two years, but it's been very rapid so far. Thank you. I'll, I've got a longer question, so oh. but in the interest of time, I'll contact you later. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.